Okay, so, well, it's such a pleasure to be here. Uh, can you hear me all right? Uh, it's been such a rich set of talks already. Um, I, you've given me a lot uh, to think about going forward. Uh, my focus is going to be on what religious faith is or can be, as faith is understood in the Judeo-Christian tradi tradition. And I'm sorry, I, I guess I anticipated a bigger screen, so the text may be hard to read. Um, you can just listen along uh, uh, if you can. Yeah, we, we tried, and I think it's just not bright enough, but yeah. yeah. So, I take it that having faith typically involves cognitive, affective, and behavioral uh, components. But today I want to explore a view that locates what is most central to faith in the realm of action, and in particular in certain kinds of commitments and decisions to remain actively engaged in a long-term relationship. So first I want to motivate the idea that an understanding of faith as a voluntary act can plausibly be seen as an authentic expression of faith uh, for, from within the Judeo-Christian tradition. And I guess you know, I'll be happy um, if, uh, if, if I can uh, show you that this is just one uh, a legitimate uh, understanding of faith. Uh, you know, I think, I think there are many in books that were written over, you know, a thousand year period by many different authors. We, we get many different uses of faith um, in uh, the Hebrew Bible, the Greek New Testament. But um, second, I'll offer some remarks about the kinds of interpersonal contexts in which faith might be thought to have value. And although much of my time today will be devoted uh, to these tasks, uh, I will tentatively set out some rough analyses of faith that I'd like to get your feedback on. Um, and looking ahead, I'm interested in what I see as potentially exciting implications um, that a commitment-based understanding of faith might have for the way that we think about a number of issues. Um, I, I think that it allows us, on the one hand, to understand how faith can be resilient in the face of profound doubts uh, in a way and to an extent that uh, confident belief is not. And moreover, I think with further development, uh, I expect it will become clear that given certain combinations of values and willingness to risk, one could rationally have and maintain faith in a variety of subpar evidential uh, circumstances without epistemic or practical irrationality. Commitment-based faith also allows us uh, to understand how faith uh, can be a free and voluntary response while recognizing the stake that these religious traditions have in truth-valued claims about reality. So I'm eager um, to receive your comments and also open to be shown, being shown a, a better way forward here. So in the writings of the Greek New Testament, the noun pistis and the verb pistuo become the primary terms for the personal and corporate response, uh, relational response that God has said to desire of humans. So what sort of response is God said to desire? And can we even make sense of why such a response would be valued? To have faith in at least one important sense is to trust in or rely on God. There's a great deal of functional overlap between faith and faithfulness and trust and trustworthiness. And indeed, I think these terms are often interchangeable. Uh, I, I think this is roughly correct um, with one significant caveat. So although faith is in the conceptual neighborhood of trust, it's important to my argument um, that we not too quickly assume that what the biblical authors had in mind uh, was a passive psychological state uh, that one simply finds oneself in. If that's how you think about trust, then I'm talking about something a little bit um, different. So as Swinburne has it, uh, to trust someone is to act on the assumption that she will do for you 
what she knows that you want or need, when the evidence gives some reason for supposing that she may not, and where there will be bad consequences if the assumption is false, uh, we're to act on the assumption that P is to do those actions that you would do if you believe the stated assumption strongly. So the idea that I'm exploring is that faith can consist at its core in an act of trust understood as a voluntary decision to rely upon someone or something. A commitment of faith involves one in a relationship in which one freely gives charge to or entrusts matters of personal concern and well-being to the care and judgment of another person. I'll argue that the reliant response uh, that constitutes faith in the Judeo-Christian tradition uh, is or can be an act of commitment to an ongoing relationship with God in which one depends upon the continuing faithfulness, steadfast love, and unfailing mercy or chesed of God. So, in the Gospel of Mark, faith is introduced into the narrative on the lips of Jesus with a call to action. Repent and have faith in the good news that the kingdom of God has drawn near. What is called for is submission to God's reign, which begins with an act of repentance and a radical reorientation of one's life. This turning away from the ways of the world, from sin, self-reliance, and other idols to God is closely associated with John's ministry, where it was expressed in the public act of baptism, in which one symbolically dies, surrendering one's old self to be born into a new life centered around obedience to God. So through this free and self-conscious act of commitment in response to the proclamation, one takes one's life takes on a direction or aim uh, to which all other pursuits and allegiances are subordinated. Jesus' call is to come, follow me. And this is not a request that one feel a certain way, nor, does a, nor is it a presentation of evidence. It's an invitation to do something, uh, to perform an action, uh, to begin a walk with Jesus. And this terse call to action, striking for its lack of propositional content, is noteworthy not as a demand to assent to a set of propositions that would later be articulated in creeds, but as an invitation to begin a walk along a path, the destination of which remains enticingly unknown. So in Mark's narrative, uh, the disciples are asked to radically alter the course of their lives and to trust at great risk to their own personal well-being with very little information about who Jesus is. Jesus is quite comfortable leaving people with questions or at best partial understanding. His teachings take the form of parables that offer tantalizing pictures of what God is like but which raise as many questions as they answer and puzzle even his closest followers. Jesus does at times chastise his disciples for having too little faith. And the narrative takes it for granted that the presence or absence of faith is an appropriate target for praise or, and reward, or of rebuke and lament. But his goal is not, it seems, to get propositional assent from the crowds. A proper response to God's faithfulness and to the gift of God's grace is gratitude, praise, and repentance for one's own sinfulness and unfaithfulness to the covenant. But God desires a relationship that is not simply coerced, a relationship into which we freely choose to enter, cherish, and intend to cultivate and sustain over time. To talk of faith and faithfulness is most at home in the context of interpersonal relations. The Hebrew Bible <coughs> compares Adonai's relationship to Israel to the relations between king and subjects, shepherd and flock, parent and child, husband and wife. But Israel's primary understanding of its relation to God is centered on the idea of covenant, a mutual agreement in which one or both parties make solemn promises to perform or refrain from specified actions. God makes promises, um, some of which are unconditional, 
and some of which carry certain obligations, such as demands for exclusive loyalty or obedience. For the people of Israel, these responsibilities included observation, observance of, of Torah and allegiance to Adonai alone. There are more than half a dozen Hebrew terms um, that can be translated as faith, trust, or faithfulness in, in some context. We have a rich vocabulary for talking about uh, fidelity. But the family of words most consistently translated by pistis in the Septuagint are derived from the root aman, uh, the word from uh, which we get our affirmation, amen, uh, let it be so, so be it. And among these, emunah <coughs> uh, and ameth, uh, which connote faith, faithfulness, <coughs> firmness, fidelity, uh, as, as Sam said yesterday, reliability and stability over time are particularly important. Um, emunah and ameth uh, frequently occur in connection with hesed, uh, the steadfast love, loyalty, unfailing mercy, loving kindness, and affection that is ascribed to God, um, a term that Sackenfeld uh, renders faithfulness in action. So faith and faithfulness are related in the same way, I think, as trust and trustworthiness. Um, for a wife to have faith in her husband is for to trust that he will be faithful, honoring the commitments that they've made together in large ways and small. And perhaps it's easier to see the role that faith plays if we start by noting what is good and valuable about faithfulness. So faithfulness brings security, assurance, and stability to a relationship. Um, goods that can be enjoyed and appreciated by the other party. A child <coughs> can rely on and take refuge in a parent whose loving kindness is steadfast, reliable, and firm. Sheep benefit from a shepherd uh, who consistently protects them. A faithful husband or a trustworthy mother, when recognized as such, has a wonderful gift to impart to that relationship. Uh, in cases where having faith in someone is clearly a well-placed response to the other person's faithfulness, it can clearly open up new possibilities for relationships that are worth having uh, for all parties involved. We want parents uh, who we can trust to take care of us, loyal friends or neighbors who we can count on in times of trouble, and parents who are partners who will act out of consideration for our good as well as our own as well as their own. <clears throat> this sort of faith is nothing to boast about. Uh, its values re value resides not in constituting a kind of intrinsically admirable Aristotelian character trait or disposition of the one who has faith, uh, but as an offspring of the other party's faithfulness, as a good that can be bestowed and gratefully enjoyed as part of a shared relationship uh, that is, other things being equal, uh, thereby less anxious uh, and insecure, more intimate, durable, and lasting, and so on. There are also contexts in which faith is tested, where the active dimension of faith is most apparent, and where faith can clearly add another sort of value. So suppose that someone makes a decision to trust you on some matter that leaves her recognizably open to vulnerabilities that may be quite significant for her if, you, if uh, <coughs> her faith in you is betrayed. And where there's some reason for her to think that you may not come through for her or carry through on your promises. By remaining faithful to her own commitments and by tenaciously trusting or patiently waiting for you, her faith also contributes to the stability and endurance of the relationship through trying times. The fact that, that such faith can be abused or become unhealthy or irrational in the wrong sort of relationship need not prevent us from recognizing the ways in which it might open our relationship to goods like stability, security, and resilience potentially to be found in such relationships, goods which it might otherwise be difficult to access. 
This sort of engaged, life-orienting commitment to a relationship centered up upon loving God and loving one's neighbors is a central, <coughs> central part of the response that God is said to desire of humans. As in marriage, one can commit oneself to living in a long-term relationship, a covenantal relationship to God or to Jesus, in which one intends to remain faithfully engaged. As Walter Brueggemann points out in his entry on faith in uh, the Hebrew Bible, it says, in the Old Testament, faith is regarded as trust in and is more elemental than assent to. But trust is not to be understood primarily in emotive terms. Trust is a practice that entails obedience to Torah and its specific requirements. Israel's fidelity to Adonai, not unlike fidelity in marriage, thus consists of concrete acts that take the other party with defining seriousness. So the concept in view here is a practice or action, behaviors that are expressed in obedience and are comparable to fidelity in marriage. In contrast, both to something fundamentally cognitive and to something fun fundamentally affective. On this sort of covenant-based understanding of marriage, both parties <coughs> understand themselves to have freely entered into a mutual relationship that is based on sacred promises or commitments. And because faith of this active sort is grounded in one's commitment to remaining in a relationship with the other, one, must one might decide to carry on faithfully engaging in the relationship on the assumption that the other is and will also be faithful even in circumstances where the other party's faithfulness is far from apparent. I think that's, that's consistent with the idea of fidelity that, that um, Sam was calling our attention to yesterday. Uh, the sort of commitment-based faith that might be called for in some circumstances, if it's to be at all rational, uh, is emphatically not that one adopt an epistemic opinion that is wildly out of step with the evidence, um, but a risky decision to act with, with wi eyes wide open to one's vulnerabilities. Nor is this sort of relationship at its best dependent upon the waxing and waning of one's momentary desires. It is this sort of thought that also lies behind Mother Teresa's uh, firm insistence that what's important in prayer is not what you feel, but rather the act of obedience. Faith and faithfulness in covenantal relations between humans and God is explicitly compared to human covenants of marriage. Comparisons of Israel's fidelity or infidelity to faithful or, or a faithful or unfaithful spouse is a particularly prominent motif in the prophetic literature. All four Gospels and Paul take Christ as a symbolic bridegroom for his followers or, or of the church. And this nuptial imagery carries into later theological traditions. Um, so in the liberty of a Christian, Luther speaks of the wedding ring of faith and writes, uh, faith unites the soul with Christ as a bride is united with her bridegroom. So my main claim again is that faith can be characterized as a voluntary act, and in particular, uh, faith can be characterized as an, an active commitment to a relationship in which one relies upon the other party to be faithful. And I have in mind a decision, or better, a series of ongoing decisions that constitute and express a gritty, resolute, risk-taking, resilient, determined, stubborn commitment to a relationship with the other party <clears throat> that's closely intertwined with and indeed inseparable from one's own faithfulness. Describing this sort of relationship maintaining self-surrender, Mother Teresa says, every day you have to say yes to God. So speaking of Mother Teresa, um, in 1942, Mother Teresa made a private vow to God a decision which gave her life a direction or orientation towards God to which all of her other aims were subordinated. 
an active commitment to be faithful to, to this relationship. <clears throat> Through an act or series of active commitments, she took herself to have entered into a sacred relationship with Jesus, akin to marriage. And nuns in the Missionaries of Charity uh, regard themselves as a spouse of Jesus crucified. This decision gave her some moorings as she was tossed about in the dark sea of doubt. So more than 17 years later, <clears throat> she wrote, Since then I have kept this promise, and when sometimes the darkness is very dark, and I'm on the verge of saying no to God, the thought of that promise pulls me up. So many are surprised uh, to learn that she lived as she did, despite the fact that her interior life was, for decades, haunted with doubt about whether God even exists. At times she worried that there is no one to answer her prayers. So many unanswered questions live within me. I am afraid to uncover them because of the blasphemy. If there be God, please forgive me. She writes, In my soul, I feel just that terrible pain of loss, of God not wanting me, of God not being God, of God not really existing. Jesus, please forgive my blasphemies. I've been told to write everything. That darkness that surrounds me on all sides, I, I can't lift my soul to God. No light or separation or inspiration enters my soul. I speak of love for souls, of tender love for God, words that pass through my lips, and I long with a deep longing to believe them. What do I labor for? If there be no God, there can be no soul. And if there is no soul... Jesus, you also are not true. Yet in spite of these doubts, she remains firmly committed. I'm willing to suffer, I'm willing with all my heart to suffer all that I suffer. Not only now, but for all eternity. I'm ready to wait for you for all eternity. Now, some will say, ah, you know, she, well, she lost her faith. She's no longer a believer. In fact, that's how Mother Teresa describes herself um, in places. Where is my faith? Even deep down, right in, there's nothing but emptiness and darkness. My God, how painful is this unknown pain? I have no faith. I dare not utter the words and thoughts that crowd in my heart and make me suffer untold agony. If the only conceptual resources available for understanding what faith is or can be take belief as a requirement for faith, uh, this seems like the right thing to say. But this is a spectacularly implausible description. Um, and it's not just that this way of re reading the situation confuses ideal faith with real and all too human faith. But of course, it's true that faith can be stronger or weaker at various points in the course of a journey along various cognitive, affective, and behavioral dimensions. More importantly, it's not at all clear that even during the periods in which Mother Teresa struggled with doubts that she's aptly described as having merely weak faith. To the contrary, it's precisely in such moments where the essence of faith most clearly comes into view. Sometimes it's more informative to look at what people do rather than what they say. And Mother Teresa's continued life over the decades that were marked by this condition manifest, I think, an important kind of faith, a response that many would recognize as valuable and pleasing to God. A focus on faith understood as a form of active commitment, I submit, takes us closer to understanding why. For it is precisely in times of trial, doubt, intermingled with obedient submission to God's will, that the steadfast commitment characteristic of faith as an ongoing active commitment comes into the foreground. She's still crying to God from deep within, committed to following Jesus to the ends of the earth, come what may, and remains fully devoted to a life of servanthood that is grounded in her orientation to God. 
Now, there's another point to see here. Um, so I take acts of commitment rather than dispositional states as fundamental. Um, you know, what exactly is going on in your brain uh, when you take wedding vows? Or over time, <coughs> as you remain dedicated to your beloved? You know, no doubt there are answers to these questions, but they strike an odd chord. There is no one unique psychological state involved in being married. Indeed, typically, our emotions and attitudes will fluctuate widely over the years. Similarly, I think it may be a mistake to attempt to characterize faith in terms of unique dispositions that must necessarily accompany the sorts of commitment involved uh, in faith that perseveres, either in the lives of various persons or over the course of the life of an individual. And faith is multiply real realizable in many different dispositions, um, Mother Teresa's commitment to Jesus uh, was not easily identifiable with any one cognitive or affective state. So her faith endured um, through widely different levels of confidence in the central tenets of her faith. He is not there. Heaven, souls. Why, these are just words, which words that mean nothing to me. My very life seems so contradictory. I help souls to go where? Her faith also endured through broad shifts in affect. From my childhood, I've had a most tender love for Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. But now this too is gone. I feel nothing before Jesus. All these things were once so natural to me before. I loved God with all the powers of my heart. He was the very center of everything I did and said. Now, Father, it is so dark, so different, and yet my everything is his. Because one can resolve to undertake such commitments in the absence of the characteristic cognitive or affective states that typically accompany faith, I submit that actions that take the form of voluntary commitments rather than cognitive and affective states can be fundamental to and indeed constitutive of faith. It isn't hard to see why a response like this might be pleasing to God. And we can see why uh, such commitments might be valuable on the level of ordinary human relations. All right, so, I mean, that's, that's the basic view that I'm exploring here. Um, but in, in trying to develop it with a bit more conceptual clarity, I'm attempting to build on... Um, some of the locutions for faith that Trent Doherty uh, proposed in the 2014 summer seminar. Um, <clears throat> so Jesus, as described in the gospel narratives, and Paul through his epistles, confront us with both proclamation and invitation, with particular claims that God exists, that Jesus is the Messiah, the truth or falsity of which are independent of what we think or how we feel, and with instructions for appropriate response. Um, repent, accept the gift of God's grace, seek to align yourself with God's will. So the Judeo-Christian tradition makes some claims about reality, and a, a full response of faith, I think, involves both in some way embracing, receiving, affirming, or assenting to the propositional content, perhaps Believing, hoping, trusting, accepting it, holding it dear, assuming it, or pledging our allegiance to it. Some kind of faith that. And undertaking to live in light of it. Some sort of faith in. And so, my strategy is to start with the notion of an act of faith as the basic notion. And then, having located this notion clearly in the domain of action, I want to see whether we can go on to characterize um, faith in a person and propositional faith, faith that, in terms of the more fun fundamental notion of acts of faith. And so here's a tentative, very tentative proposal. And since we're short on time, I'm not going to read through it now, but we can come back to it in the discussion. Um, By 
locating faith in the realm of action rather than in the realm of epistemic opinion, one potentially attractive or, you know, or repulsive uh, consequence is that it allows enthusiasts of uh, formal epistemology to evaluate practical rationality of uh, decisions, the decisions in question with the apparatus of decision theory. Uh, so, and like it or not, um, I think it follows as a rigorous consequence of these sorts of approaches that given the right combination of core values and willingness to risk, so given high enough valuations of certain kinds of outcomes, given the truth of Christianity, in contrast to what one takes to be relevant alternatives, uh, I think it can be practically rational for a person to act on faith um, even when one's subjective probabilities for Christianity are very low, uh, but non-zero. And I, um, Ted Poston and Trent Doherty have written a little bit on this. Um, the epilogue to Richard Swinburne's Faith and Reason talks about this some. Um, and I, I think, second, that you can do all this while conducting your intellectual life like the solemn and well-behaved evidentialist um, that we should be. So this, this kind of faith need not involve believing anything on insufficient evidence. In what sense could faith of this sort, sort be truth-oriented? If faith is truth-oriented, um, will one end up making conceptual moves that would open it to legitimate criticism in the realm of epistemic rationality? And this summer, Lindsay Rettler um, raised some questions, some great and challenging questions along these lines that forced uh, me to think about these issues further. Glad you're here, Lindsay. Um, So, but is belief the only attitude that can play the requisite role of preserving the truth-oriented character of faith without epistemic irrationality? I mean, I think it's clear that a justified um, belief could play that role. Um, but there are also voluntary decisions uh, that one can make, in including a mental act of adopting a policy to use a proposition like God exists in one's practical and theoretical reasoning. And in my view, so a lot of us have been talking about um, acceptance and assumption, um, this kind of uh, act-based trust, um, cashed out as a kind of risk-taking behavior on behalf of the good. Um, and I, I think that what these share in common is that they're all voluntary mental acts. These are actions. Uh, behaviorally, they're particular ways of or species of acting as if. And so take the notion of S as acting as if P uh, as basic. Despite equivalence at the behavioral level, um, there's an important difference between the person who merely acts as if P engaging in a kind of pretense and another who fully believes P and then consistently acts on it. Could the same be true for one whose purely epistemic opinion or subjective probability falls short of the range to which we ordinarily ascribe belief, uh, but who then goes on to accept or assume or trust on faith that God exists? I, I think that it can. So for the vast majority of those who identify strongly with the Jewish and Christian traditions yesterday and today, this is no game. The stakes are real and the costs of commitment can be high, even in this life. Faith commitments of the sort we have in view involve acts such as throwing in one's lot, taking a stand, and orienting one's life around the assumption that there is such a person as God. Sometimes you can learn more about a person's intellectual commitments by posing a conditional question rather than by asking what she believes. 
such questions are of the, the form, suppose that P is the case, what, if any, consequences would this have for what you think or do? How would you feel or respond then? How would, how would you react if you found out that your husband was cheating on you? Would that matter to you? If faith typically involves not only opinion, but also a complex array of decisions, commitments, values, resolutions, and aims, then often asking a person how a person would respond, assuming a hypothetical set of conditions, can be far more revealing of her attitudes, commitments, and of the significance that a person or relationship or state of affairs has in his or her life. So how would you react if you suddenly knew for certain that God, Adonai, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Jesus does not exist. That there is no other someone to be related to. Would that matter to you? Would that fact have significance in your life? I think that for people of faith, like Mother Teresa, posing such questions asks them to imagine a scenario in which a truth claim that they take to be an essential part of the Christian story is false. The very, the very center of their faith commitments has clearly not been vindicated. If a person's response is to weep, to react in horror to this nightmare, to lament, you know, all is lost, I must find a way to carry on, but it should no longer be from within the Christian tradition, then I think surely this is an indication that one's response of faith here and now is no game of pretense and of the stake one has in reality being a particular way. Thank you.